This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Juan González. Well, we end today's show in Texas, where a black activist says he is the first person to be targeted and prosecuted under a secretive U.S. surveillance effort to track so-called black identity extremists. On December 12th, activist Rakim uh, Balagoon uh, awoke to armed FBI agents storming his Dallas home apartment. He was then jailed for nearly six months without the possibility of bail, as the FBI investigated him for domestic terrorism, in part because of his Facebook posts criticizing police brutality. He was released earlier this month after U.S. attorneys failed to prosecute him. Balagoon is a founding member of the group's guerrilla mainframe and the Huey P. Newton Gun Club. The groups coordinate meals for homeless people, organize youth picnics, run self-defense classes, protest police brutality, and advocate for the rights of black gun owners. The Guardian reports investigators began tracking him after he was part of a 2015 protest against police brutality. Brutality, and that FBI and that the FBI learned about the protests from a video on Infowars, a far right website run by Alex Jones. Balogun's arrest comes after a leaked August 2017 report from F the FBI's Domestic Terrorism Analysis Unit revealed that the FBI claiming, quote, it is very likely black identity extremists' perceptions of police brutality against African Americans spurred an increase in premeditated, retaliatory, lethal violence against law enforcement and will very likely serve as justification for such violence. Civil liberties groups have slammed the FBI report, comparing the memo to the FBI's covert COINTELPRO program of the 1950s, 60s and 70s, counterintelligence program, which targeted civil rights movement. Many have also noted the FBI memo was dated August 3rd, only a few days before the deadly white supremacist rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, where white supremacist Ku Klux Klan members and neo-Nazis killed an anti-racist protester, Heather Heyer, and injured dozens more. The FBI does not seem to be surveilling and targeting white people who post violent things to social media, including multiple white men who've recently carried out mass school shootings. Uh, Demetrius <laughs> Kabuchis, uh, who shot dead eight students and two teachers last week at Santa Fe High School in Texas had posted on his Facebook page a picture of a T-shirt reading, Born to Kill. Nicholas Cruz, the 19-year-old man who killed 17 people at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High in Parkland, Florida, on Valentine's Day, had shared numerous posts on social media, so disturbing he was reported to the FBI multiple times, yet they never arrested him. Well, for more, we go to Texas, where we're joined by Rakem Balagoon, who was released earlier this month after being held for nearly six months in San Francisco. We're joined by Makia Cyril, co-founder and executive director of the Center for Media Justice and a Black Lives Matter Bay Area activist. Um, let's begin with Rakem. You were arrested December 12th. Describe what happened. Well, uh, pretty much on December 12th, around 6 a.m. in the morning, uh, me and my son was at home resting when FBI agents rammed our door and immediately rushed us outside in our underwear you know, um, under gunpoint to um, be arrested and um, for me and my son to be, you know, separated and and overall me be hauled off to um, jail. And what did they tell you? Um, on what grounds? What you were you charged with? I was charged with 922G, which is prohibited possession of a firearm. And... Uh, uh did you have a license for the firearm? Well, in the state of Texas, um, we don't—you you don't need a license or even have to register firearms to have them legally, um, long as, you know, you're not a failing or considered a prohibited person, um, you're able to have firearms, you know, within your home or your vehicle, and if it's a, a long barrel um, rifle, and you're able to open carry that without any uh, licenses or anything of that nature. Why were you held for almost a year, Rakim? A half a year? Well, the reason why I was held was because the FBI um, was pretty much surveillance me for t over two and a half years as a um, domestic terrorist. And um, out from, you know, surveillance of me, for being a domestic terrorist, you know, they 
overreached and tried to use a, um, a previous charge from, you know, 2005 to say that this charge made me prohibited of having a firearm, which the elements of that charge actually didn't. But the reason I was able to be detained for so long is because when I initially got locked up, um, I went to a magistrate hearing with a magistrate judge for a bond, and the judge denied me bond based off of me using my First Amendment right to criticize police officers on Facebook. And how was your case ultimately resolved? It was dismissed. Um, you know, we filed pretrial motions um, stating that I am not a prohibited person and, and forcing the um, United States government to prove that I'm a prohibited person um, not to have firearms. And you know, you, the government failed to prove that. And so, therefore, they had to release me after holding me o over five months of being detained. Um, let's bring Malkia Cyril into this conversation with the Center for Media Justice. Malkia, your thoughts on how Facebook and Instagram posts of people um, like the alleged mass shooters in Texas and Florida were able to post guns and other threatening language and symbols on their Facebook page, yet someone like Rakem is surveilled and held in jail for half a year and then not charged? Well, first of all, let's be very clear. The history of gun control in this country is totally and completely focused on controlling the possession of weapons of, of, of black people while allowing white people to, to, to run free, uh, shoot, shooting up the nation. So I think that we have to, first of all, understand that, you know, whether we're talking about posting online or we're talking about just living, you know, your offline life, there's discrimination in how black people and white people are treated in terms of their First Amendment rights and in terms of their, their right to carry. Um, second of all, on Facebook, we already know that black activists are being censored. Um, our victims of hate speech regularly uh, are surveilled. There, there's uh, undue cooperation between Facebook and law enforcement agencies when it comes to the targeting of black activists. So um, the online space, uh, particularly on these platforms, these social media platforms, and especially on Facebook, the largest social media platform in the world, uh, is a contested space, is a discriminatory space, and is a space that is d uh, virulently anti-black. Uh, I want to turn to Texas State Representative Sheila Jackson Lee, questioning Attorney General Jeff Sessions in November about the leaked FBI counterterrorism memo claiming that so-called black identity extremists pose a threat to law enforcement. Are you familiar with the names Eric Garner, Walter Scott, Jameer Rice? My question is, as I hold up the poster dealing with the report under your jurisdiction, Black Identity Extremists, uh, it is interesting to me that you are opposing individuals who are opposing lethal force, similar to the attack on Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King on COINTELPRO, but there seems to be no report dealing with the Tiki Torch Parade in Charlottesville chanting, Jews will not replace us. Why is there an attack on black activists versus any reports dealing with the alt-right and the white nationalists? Can you answer that question quickly? I'm not Are aware. Are on investigating that? When was that report completed? In August of 2017. I'm not aware of, I have not studied that report. I ask you to, because it's an attack on individuals who are simply trying to petition the government in a redress of grievances. That was U.S. Representative Sheila Jackson Lee uh, questioning Attorney General Jeff Sessions. Makia Cyril, your, uh, your comments. I mean, look, white supremacists have committed the largest share of domestic extremist uh, related killings last year. We know that white supremacy and white supremacists represent the biggest domestic threat to the United States. And yet, Trump cut funding to countering violent extremism uh, to fight white supremacy. We understand very clearly where the priorities lie. And in a digital environment, those priorities—that uh, that discrimination and that 
um, undue focus on on black people and black activists becomes exacerbated. So that you know, the you know, first of all, I'm just so happy to hear that sister speak so clearly uh, to this issue. But we understand very, very clearly that under these current political conditions, black activists are being targeted, Muslims are being targeted, immigrants are being targeted, while white supremacists are running free. And what is happening with your battle against the FBI's Black Identity Extremist Program, which I think a lot of people are going to be hearing for the first time right here at Makia? Well, let's be clear. You know, I want to remind you all that in the, in the 70s, um, what it took to even bring the counterintelligence program that was targeting the, the, the Black Panther Party uh, and other civil rights activists to light. Uh, you know, several white people had to break into an FBI office, expose that program through illegal means, right? Today, we have FOIAs, we have, you know, Color of Change, uh, Center for Media Justice, uh, ACLU, Center for Constitutional Rights, have, uh, ha have um, used the FOIA process to, uh, to, to find out more information about this program. Um, Color of Change has been able to uncover uh, something called a race paper, you know, where, 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 where they're looking into, you know, what really is going on. But at the, at the end of the day, we understand that very little information is available to us. Uh, part of the problem is the deep lack of transparency. We know that the FBI is undergoing its own separate crisis, which makes it even more difficult under the current political conditions to get any information. We know that members of Congress, you know, as you just heard, have uh, have gone to the FBI, um, you, you know, FBI director, have gone to uh, Jeff Sessions and demanded information and not received any. So right now, we see those in power stalling, not sharing information. I think it will require a lawsuit. Uh, of pretty significant proportions, just to get basic information, the goal of which is to get the FBI to withdraw this designation, to uh, rescind any funds dedicated to attacking black activists using this designation. Um, but it's going to be an uphill battle and one that we're prepared to, 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 to be on. We're Rakim, um, are, do you think you are still under surveillance? And what happened— Yes, I'm, yes I do. And how are you going to challenge what happened to you, being held and then um, not tried? Well, you know, what, what I definitely want to do is definitely um, continue to bring up the conversation if have the, you know, federal government overreached in its attempt to identify, you know, domestic terrorists. And, you know, I also want to bring to the conversation um, the FBI um, goal into, you know, pretty much retaliating against um, black activists for, the, you know, black activists protesting against the excessive use of, you know, police, uh, of abuse. And so, you know, as, you know, as this, you know, continue to unfold, you know, because I've only been out of um, their custody for two months. So right now I'm currently just getting back to being back out in regular society and things of that nature. But me and my team, we will continue to well, hold Rakim, you know, the government Well, Rakim we want to thank you for being we with us. Um, push um, for law. And also Malkia Ciro. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Thanks for joining us.